And so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel. I'm going to set the scene and then off we go to them. So we've got with us today four speakers giving different dimensions of the food debate. We have, we have with us Dr. Angelina Bellamy Sanderson, who's Senior Research Fellow at the Sustainable Places Research Institute at Cardiff University, with a particular interest around food production systems and how do we make healthier, more sustainable food the, the standard for what we do in Wales. And, and um, Angelina is going to be kicking off the piece um, in a few minutes time. We, and Angelina is going to be followed by Katie Palmer. Katie is Programme Manager at Food Sense Wales. And Food Sense Wales brings together a range of potentially transformational projects, such as sustainable food cities, Peace Please activities in Wales, and bringing people together through food and particularly healthy, sustainable food. Then um, Katie will be followed by Duncan Fisher. Duncan is, um, Duncan is co-founder of Our Food, a new food initiative um, started in Brecon about rebuilding the local food economy. And he's also involved with the new We All Wellbeing Economy Alliance as well, which is launched. And then bringing things home with the practicalities about how we take this into other business is Simon Wright from Wright's Food. And Simon has been a long-standing campaigner for the idea for the need for a so seed to plate and seed to soul understanding of food and is working on that in Carmarthenshire at the moment. And so just before we kick off with, with Angelina's piece. I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about the framing of what, 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 this, what this is about, why a revolution is needed. And, and I suppose it seems to me that we're, we're stuck in a place, if we leave things just to government, where it's too easy to do things like declare climate emergencies and end up declaring an emergency and then doing nothing about it. And we've ended up in a perverse place where it's too easy for politicians to, to make incremental changes and get rewarded for those because they don't have the space to talk about revolutionary ideas because they're not going to be around for long enough to do that. In my, my own experience, I spent 12 or, 12 or 15 years as a non-exec on Countryside Council for Wales and then Natural Resources Wales. And one thing that became really clear to me is that the many of the things, or not most of the things wrong with our food system, well, that's the destruction of habitat, the loss, the, the contribution to climate change caused by food waste or the damage to our land and our soils and our rivers, nearly all of that has been legal. So it's, it's not illegal to damage soil, it's not illegal to damage biodiversity, it's certainly not illegal to produce products that make people sick and cause them to die younger. So it's not, it's not just this, the, the way that we're making decisions that are wrong, it's the fundamental legislation that determines what's okay. So a revolution is needed that ends up with businesses paying the full price for the damage they're causing. So we can eliminate what's called the, what accountants call externalities and then really start to address the big ticket issues. And so one of the projects I'm working on at the minute is called the Wales Food Initiative, which I'm working on with UCL in London and the North Star Transition and we're bringing together some of the people on this call and food leaders from farming unions, health professionals, insurance, flood, water, finance, to have a different conversation about where the shared interests lie. Because at the moment, the health boards don't buy food for health. They buy food for money. And we're not, we know the government departments I talk to don't see food loss, soil loss as being a strategic risk that's serious enough to actually put it into people's targets to address those kind of things. We know that the Welsh Health Service spends around about 500 million pounds a year dealing with the cost of diabetes and 80% or so of that is avoidable. So we, we need somehow need to reconnect food, land, people health and the needs of future generations in a really different way. And so the revolution for me is about stepping beyond those incremental changes but to start the conversation, imagining where we want to get to and then work the steps back from that to where we are today. And to set the scene on that, it's a great pleasure to introduce Angelina, who's going to set the scene from a policy and Wales perspective on where we need to, to start the foundations of our revolution. So Angelina, over to you. Thanks, Andy. So Andy asked me to talk about the foundations of the revolution, but I would argue actually that 
everybody here is working on that foundation of the revolution um, in, in all of the activities that everyone's doing to try and create change and transformation in our food system. However, in order, as part of that revolution, we also need to be changing policy in order to support the transformation of the Welsh food system to a food system that is fit for future generations. So we're in the midst of a number of crises. Uh, we've got COVID-19 at the moment, and we're about to head into another one, which is Brexit. And both of these have a significant impact on our food systems. But they've also focused the national attention on food systems. I mean, all you have to do is look at the national media headlines, notably in the last few weeks, uh, the work that Marcus Rashford has been doing to push free school meals during the half term in England to see that food is really on the conscious, on the national conscience, really. And so these crises, while, while they're creating extreme challenges for, for food system stakeholders, they also result in windows of opportunities where we can create change, especially as they also coincide with the Welsh Assembly elections coming up next spring. So with that in mind, I note that it's manifesto season and recognizing that we can do more when we act collectively. A number of organizations across the Welsh food system have joined together in order to amplify our collective voice and we formed the Food Policy Alliance Cymru. So Katie, who's going to be speaking after me, um, has been instrumental in bringing us together in order to create a more collective voice and um, to try and create change at a policy level. So um, you should be able to see my screen. And here is uh, just our sort of um, terms of reference, you could say, uh, that we're a coalition of organizations and stakeholders that are building and promoting a collective vision for the Welsh food system. So, and you see across the bottom, the different organizations that are part of the Alliance and Really, the goal was to try and spread across all different parts of the food system so that we could ensure that our voices were collectively coming together and that we didn't um, miss out on valuable perspectives across the food system. Now, it's, it, I'm, I think there's still more organizations we can bring on board to um, really reach entirely across the system, but uh, our our sort of um, the aims of what we're trying to do is to co-produce a vision of for a food system in Wales that connects production, supply, and consumption, and gives equal consideration to the health and well-being of people and nature. Uh, we're also advocating for policy change to address the climate and ecological emergencies, um, the public health crisis, and the rise in food insecurity. And we also want to work to ensure that Wales is linked to UK policy, research opportunities, and the broader global system. Um, so what we've done is we've come together and we've developed a manifesto, which is a series of asks that we want the different political parties to include in their manifestos so that whoever gets voted into power come next spring, we can ensure that um, a food system approach will be part of their agenda. And the reason for this is because at the moment, what you've got are several different departments across government that all act very much in their own silos. And we're missing huge opportunities to create synergies across different departments. So for example, education, health, food, agriculture, procurement, those are all falling under different departments, but when you bring them together, there's a potential to create real synergies across the policies that they're enacting. So the big overarching ask of our manifesto is to create a food system commission. And the idea is that by bringing together a commission with, uh, with independent stakeholders from across the food system, that that commission would, deliver, would develop a roadmap for delivering a food system fit for future generations. And the roadmap should consider six, a series of six priorities, which we've set out. And these are all sort of target based because we felt that nothing sort of galvanizes attention better than a, a good target to measure yourself against. Did you meet the target? Yes or no? Um, so the first one's about food for all, and that's ensuring that 
we, we eliminate food insecurity in Wales, which means we eliminate the need for food banks and everybody has access to the food that they need to live in a dignified way and lead a healthy life. And to, we, we want to achieve that by 2025 and Wales would be the first nation to do so. Uh, second ask is about food for public health. So it's the idea that 75% of Eat Well's recommended vegetable consumption is produced sustainably in Wales for Wales. So that means really increasing the horticulture production here in Wales and also increasing the consumption of vegetables um, among the Welsh population. And then the third ask is about a net zero food system. And so the idea is to develop a plan by 2022 in order to get us to net zero by 2035. Um, and then the fourth priority we see is about farming for nature and climate. And so this really overlaps with the third priority. And this is about creating a roadmap by 2022 to adopt agroecological principles across the whole food system. So this would include 100% agroecological food production here in Wales by 2030. Um, so that's all farms using agroecological practices, which does uh, represent a significant shift in our production practices. However, this is really the kinds of transformations we need to see if we're really going to get to net zero by 2050, which is, I think, what the UK has signed up for at the moment. Uh, the fifth priority is around sustainable seafood. So that's ca setting catch limits without any further delay. So immediately um, that enable fish stocks to be restored and maintained above the biomass levels, um, which would deliver maximum sustainable yield. And the final ask is about sustainable food sector jobs and livelihoods. So this is about everybody working in the food sector or food system receives at least the living wage or fair return for their work. So whether that work is on land or sea, it should be free from exploitative practices and it should be varied, engaging and empowering. Um, so those are the six priorities that we set out. Um, and I think Katie can also add to that perhaps as she speaks, but I, I think I'll hand it over to her now. That's fantastic, Angelina. Really great introduction piece. And I think setting the scene with really specific things that can be answered, did you or didn't you do that? I know is so, so important to know. Certainly something that Katie has been really pushing to get people action focused on measurable things. So Katie, over to you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just pressing all the various different buttons I need to press. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen, which I should be should be sharing now? Give me a thumbs up. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Angelina. Um, so I'm going to talk about a revolution in health eating um, as per Andy's request. Um, and I thought before I did this, I'd better just check I really knew what the word revolution meant. Um, and when I looked up the, um, the definition, I'm guessing that Andy didn't want me to talk about overthrowing government. But maybe he wanted me to talk about dramatic and wide reaching change in conditions, attitudes and operation. And really what I want to do here is kind of substitute that word or for and. And really that just gives us then what Angelina has been talking about in terms of this kind of taking a food systems approach. So I'm just going to move people on my screen because they're in the way. Let me just get rid of that. Okay, that's better. So um, Andy was asking us to talk about the what, the who, the why, and the how, um, and giving some examples. So that's what I'm going to do. So what do we need for a food revolution? Angelina has already talked about the first um, thing that I want to talk about, which is a food system commission, which should be independent, cross-sector, should include civil society, and should be appointed um, by government. The second thing that we need is a food in all policies approach. We need effective integration of our production, supply and consumption policies across all of government. And we need that at a local and national level. We also need to draw in all of those other policies that touch on the food space, things like education, planning, procurement, I could go on. 
And then the third thing that we need is a good food movement. And Andy at the beginning really kind of, I think this is in the space he's sitting at the moment. We need an army of good food advocates that are going to drive change at a grassroots level, um, people that are going to do things and that they're going to hold government to account for the promises that they make. So why do we need these two things? Why do we need a food systems commission and the food and all policies approach and a good food movement? When looking at health, really, we're looking at a number of different reasons why people make the food choices that they make. And those reasons touch on a whole range of different um, policy spheres, whether from an environmental perspective or an economic perspective or a social perspective. So I've listed a whole load here. I'm guessing there's more that, and some that I've missed out. We also need a commission and a food in all policies approach and a good food movement because of the size of the challenge we have ahead of us. We've got 27% of our four and five-year-olds that are an unhealthy weight. As we move into adulthood, we have 60% of adults who are an unhealthy weight. As Andy mentioned at the beginning, with a 500 million pound cost, which is 10% of the NHS budget um, from diabetes. And we've got 7.6% of the population currently suffering from di diabetes and 90% of that burden is type two, the type which is affected by diet and lifestyle. And this is a, a quote from the um, health minister Vaughan Gethin in the Healthy Weight, Healthy Wales obesity strategy, just highlighting that if this current trend continues, more people in Wales will die prematurely. So I wanted to give you an example of, of why we need to take this cross-sector approach to addressing a food health a food health revolution. Thanks, Andy. Um, we need to look at things like financial means. And I'm gonna I'm gonna major on this now um, for this bit of the presentation because people's financial means have a massive impact on their health outcomes. The poorest 20% of UK households would need to spend 39% of their disposable income on food to meet the Eat Well Guide costs. That's the government recommended diet. And this compares to just 88% for the richest 20%. Obesity among children continues to be greater amongst the most deprived communities compared to the least. Children in deprived communities are more than one centimetre shorter on average than children in wealthy communities by the time they reach the age of 11, which to me is a, is a shocking statistic in this day and age. And you know, the food system in itself is part of the problem. 16% of workers in the food sector earn the minimum wage compared to 7% of workers across the UK in general. These are just, I should say that these are, um, this is information from the Broken Plate Report from the Food Foundation. I put the quote, I put the reference there and I, I thoroughly recommend that um, you take a look at that. And then as an example of where our welfare system really is letting um, our most vulnerable people down in society. In a Welsh classroom of 25 learners, seven will be in poverty and four of those will not qualify for free school meals, which, was, which is a you know, standard welfare from the Welsh government. And that's um, a report from um, the cost of the school day and illustrates that 70,000 children in Wales are living in poverty and unable to access free school meals. So now I wanted to tell you a bit about the how. How do we make change? How do we make this revolution happen? And I was wanting to provide you with two main examples. The first one is the sustainable food, um, food places approach. And this is about making healthy and sustainable food a defining feature of where people live. So there's over 60 cities, towns, boroughs, counties in the UK now establishing cross-sector food partnerships to transform their local food system. They're looking at food governance, they're looking at good food movements, healthy food for all, sustainable food economy, catering and procurement, and food for the planet. Food Cardiff is one of two places in Wales um, that are part of the Sustainable Food, uh, food Places Network, along with Food Vale. And we've recently um, 
we're recently bringing in funding to take a sustainable food places approach specifically for Wales. So we'll be working with um, many of the stakeholders that, that will be here today to look at how we develop that approach specifically for Wales. But I wanted just to say two things about uh, examples of, of work that Food Cardiff has done to influence and make change happen in different ways. So the first one is around, okay, I suppose, the kind of policy space. The Food Partnership um, has had an impact in its work with Cardiff Council and Cardiff Council have now developed its own sustainable food plan that touches on a number of different areas that we've discussed today. It looks at supporting children in the school holidays. It looks at developing more growing spaces in the city. It looks at um, fast food takeaways and protecting and uh, creating zones around schools and many more um, and many more things. So it's really encouraging to see that commitment from Cardiff Council. And the other thing is around the Cardiff Good Food movement. So despite um, lockdown, um, there's been some fantastic work happening on the ground to support, to support people during the difficult times. And actually it's amazing that the Good Food Cardiff Autumn Festival has managed to happen um, over this autumn. And in fact, it's just finished um, with 45 events taking place, 4,000 attendees, the distribution of 5,000 veg plants, um, 30 in-person activities and 15 virtual and almost 30 partners um, involved. And actually over the period of the last few months, um, Food Cardiff has worked with um, Cardiff Council, many, many partners across the city to deliver over 20,000 plants, seedlings and, and seeds to, to households in the city. The second example I wanted to quickly touch on was peas, please. So we know that 80% of us are not eating enough vegetables. And Peas Please brings together actors from across the whole food system, from farmers to retailers, caterers, government departments, encouraging them all to grow, serve and sell more veg. Within Peas Please, we partnered up with Sustainable Food Places to develop the Veg Cities campaign, which, which works to develop, um, I guess, what we're trying to do with Peas Please at a place-based approach um, and also working to develop an army of veg advocates who will help support and develop new ways of holding pledges to account, but also working within their communities and helping us to understand the challenges of why people aren't eating enough veg. And then on the other side, uh, one of the things that, uh, that has happened as a result of the Peas Please work and the fact that less than 2% of advertising spend goes on promoting fruit and vegetables or 2% of food and drink advertising spend goes on promoting vegetables is that we um, developed this idea of veg power, which is now an independent um, not-for-profit um, kick. And veg power uses advertising and communications to inspire kids to adopt vegetable loving habits. that Hopefully they will keep for life and in turn share with their children. We're about to launch our 2020 um, progress report for Peas Please, um, which is under embargo, so I can't sh share those figures with you. But up until 2019, um, we um, had an impact on an additional 90 portions of vegetables served as a result of Peas Please. Um, we, we now have 25 um, cities taking a veg cities approach, uh, and we're working with Veg Power. Um, as well. And as you can see, we've uh, veg power over the last 18 months have had an impact on 517 million additional child portions of veg um, and seen a 63 million um, increase in veg sales as a result of the Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign and the Associated Schools report. And I would encourage everyone to have a quick look at the video, which I was thinking of showing, but you know, I wasn't going to have time. Um, to show you, uh, it gives you a really great summary of that of that um, veg power work, and I would say is pretty revolutionary. Um, I'll finish there. Thank you, Katie. That's I think that's a fantastic piece there, and I think the thing, this, the information you shared there around the food justice piece, you know, is so vitally important. You know, the idea that the poorest tw poorest twenty percent spending nearly five times more of their take home money on that, as well as this whole issue 
um, around lack of fair wages in the, in the kind of the food sector, which I'm sure Simon will be, will be picking up on. So thanks so much for that. Duncan, um, over to you about what's the role of, kind of community growing in, in contributing to this space. We're going to take over, um, over to you right now. Thank you so much, Katie. That's great. Right, I'm off mute. Um, yeah, so I, I thought I would um, just tell the story of what we're doing in our region to create a revolution and, and sort of describe the story, which is chaotic. Um, it's, not, it's not a beautiful plan um, because that's not actually how real life works and revolutions are like that. So I, if I tell you the story about how we are building a revolution, we haven't built it yet. We're in the middle of doing it. Um, so, and and the, the the thing about food is is that it is absolutely local. If there is any national action in, uh, of change in Wales, it will be because there is action in each local area. That's the very nature of it. So, you know, my work. I mean, when I'm not doing this, I'm doing international work which is completely the other end of the scale. When it comes to food, uh, we decided to focus absolutely on the local. We know that there are lots of other local projects going across Wales and we will collaborate. The stronger we all get, the more we will collaborate and the more we will influence national policy. But it has to be strong at the local level, otherwise it's not gonna work. Um, so we started a couple of years ago with a little project called Our Food Propel. And we tried, um, so I've got a funny thing um, and we got together food businesses and said let's you know let's do more to sell food together um, it didn't work out like that because actually they were already selling everything they had and if you're already completely flat out selling everything you don't actually need to collaborate with anyone um, because you're you're happy thank you very much um, so there wasn't really much of an appetite. Um, but at, a, at one of the meetings, I heard a, a young couple talking about the fact that they were looking for three acres of land. And I thought three acres is a very particular figure. It's related to particular models of regenerative agriculture that I've been reading about. So that alerted me. And I talked to them after the meeting in the street. Um, and discovered that they were looking for three acres and they wanted to develop the exact models that we thought were the most promising, that they that were generative models coming from the United States and Canada. So basically we then flipped. Uh, we thought, right, this is something, um, we're gonna follow this. And we found them the land and we then actually financed them because they were brilliant entrepreneurs with a business plan. I didn't they, that wasn't planned. I didn't even know they existed. But because we were having community meetings, we discovered them and thought, right, that's where we'll go. We realized that increasing production for local uh, food what was the key in our area. There is not enough food that demand far outstrips supply. So until um, you know, there's much more production. We're not going to get the market and all the things that come at local food, uh, a vibrant market. Um, so we, what we did was we folk, we thought, right, we'll just focus on this farm and we'll make a song and dance of it. We'll, we'll, we'll help them and we'll make a little film about it and we'll put the film out. Um, and we did that and there's nothing like putting there's nothing like communicating that something's actually happening, even if it's microscopic. It transforms the sort of energy levels of people you talk to. Here's a film. I'll, I'll put the link to the film. We're launching a website about it today, but we, we, the, the film's online. And that really boosted us. Uh, it creates a belief. It creates a sense of, oh, something's happening. Something's happening. Doesn't matter what, it's something. Um, then things started to happen. Um, we, we had a regional meeting, we organised an assembly, about 60 people turned up. Uh, we got to know NFU, the NFU president is a local farmer to us. 
Um, we talked to the Monmouthshire County Council National Park and, and we, we got a project to, together to, uh, to manage to link up farmland with new entrepreneurs um, to replicate what we'd already done multiple times over. And that's just starting. So we've got funding, believe it or not, even in this, these times. And then last week, um, I got, we got an email from um, uh, Food Sense Wales from Katie talking about sustainable food places. Well, that we didn't, you know, we weren't really following that. Um, and suddenly we, we were having a conversation with National Park and Monmouthshire County Council. Well, let's do that. Let's set that up. And that's going to happen. Katie, you'll hear from us. Um, and suddenly we're organizing that. And that wasn't planned either, but it bounced off. So what is the, what is, what is the technique? The, the technique is really an entrepreneurial one. We relentlessly, we, we, we know where we want to be, but we don't know how to get there. And we cannot predict how we're going to get there. All we can do is relentlessly pursue the thing that's in front of our noses and constantly jump and twist and turn. We don't know what's going to happen. What happens if there are food shortages in January? Right? There could well be food shortages because we can't import any food across the ports. That will create havoc and will create a situation that we can respond to. But we have no idea even if that's going to happen. We just, it might, but we need to be kind of ready to do that. So it's really focusing. And then the other thing is when an opportunity arises, like meeting these two young entrepreneurs, follow it, chase it that's the thing to go for even if it's not quite the thing you were expecting nor that it it's the you know it it's the, it's about following what's strong building on what's strong and chasing it and that creates the opportunity to do the other things and it's different from having a master plan with 15 actions and saying right we've got to do all 15 that it, it yes you need that but but if someone is shining in one area you go with it and run it because that creates the authority. And so, so in a sense, what we're doing is slowly building up momentum, uh, real momentum. Uh, if we do the sustainable food places, which I'm sure we will, it will be relentlessly action fo focused. Uh, we will set up action groups that take things forward. Some action groups will be successful, some won't. We can't focus all our energy on the ones that don't. We have to focus our energy on the ones that do. And the more action we get, the more strength we get, the more that the, you know, the, 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 the ball will roll. And I think, um, so in a way, that's how revolutions happen. They happen with just relentless pursuit uh, of what is possible. Um, and they don't so much come about in the traditional way of building a master plan, building a, a strategic partnership with all the players. Yes, they come, that they have a place, but that isn't actually the essence of a, a revolution. The revolution is the energy of the individuals who pursue uh, a goal and never give up whatever happens to them. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic. And I think, I think it's, it's so important, Duncan, to hear your views about this, the fact that it is messy, it, it does, it, things don't work out as planned. And I, know, and I know that in the kind of funding world, sometimes that universities and program managers sit, you know, they have to have plans, but, but and, you know, and they're clearly part of those infrastructures, but it's such an important piece to your message about going, going where the energy is, is so important, being able to work with other people's ideas. And as you say, never give up, because I think, you know, we've all learned in this process that one of the things that nature's really good at is, is finding what it's given and turning it into opportunity. And that's all we need to do as we make these pieces happen. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to you in a minute in the, in, in the questions, Duncan. But next up, I want to talk here from Simon, who in his work at Rights Food has in many ways revolutionised people's perspective of what's possible in, in small communities. But I know his eye is on a much bigger prize around revolutionising revolutionizing the way that people encounter food, both in the hospitality trade and the people, their customers and providers in those wider communities. So Simon, 
um, over to you to tell us about the work you're doing in Carmarthenshire and your experiences so far and your part in catalyzing this revolution. So Simon, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, I, um, it, it was quite interesting when you asked me to do this because I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd sort of look at this from a restaurateur's point of view, which I, I normally don't actually. I normally think about it in the same terms as everybody else here, in general terms about what we might achieve, you know, the, the challenges that we've got. Um, but I was thinking a little bit about what is a restaurant or how we placed in this in this whole picture and, and, and what is it that kind of motivates us really. Um, it made me think back a bit to when I when I first got involved in the restaurant trade about 30 years ago <laughs> with a, a restaurant in a converted cow shed. It was, uh, it was started by my mother-in-law very much uh, in a kind of auberge style. Most of the stuff was cooked on a cold fire range. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable because it was a 50 color cover restaurant with just an aga and a, and a small domestic cooker. Very short set price menu, everything cooked on the premises. Um, and a lot of what was served up was from local farms and producers. And that, as I say, was, was 30 years ago. The, the cooking was very much in the Elizabeth David, Jane Grigson vein, European country cooking not too complicated and hugely reliant on the quality of the raw materials. And, I, and the, the thing is, I was thinking back to that, is that I don't remember us making any real choices about what we bought on the basis of sustainability then. You know, I wouldn't say it was completely absent from our minds, but it wasn't, it wasn't a key thing. It was all about the quality, the freshness, the flavor and the texture. Um, but it was sort of, you know, guess what? If you want those things, you buy local, you didn't buy intensive and, and, and it wasn't so much out of politics, um, but because that was the way to put the best food that you could on the table. So in a way it was out of passion, out, out, of, out of love really. Um, I, myself, I came from a, a relatively working class background, so I hadn't had much experience of eating out as a youngster, but I already kind of knew most of those things anyway. I mean, how, how couldn't you? I mean, if we look back to our youth, it, it was obvious to me that um, the potatoes that my grandmother dug up from her back garden were way better than any we got from, from the supermarket and that, um, I don't know, the meat she got for Sunday lunch from the butcher up the road came from a local farm um, and was an unbelievable treat and should be treated with respect and reverence and, you know, both in the cooking of it and, and, and in the sharing of it around the table with the family, for instance. And, and 30 odd years of, I suppose in 30 odd years of experience in, in the restaurant game has only really confirmed this. It's, it's second nature to us to work with local suppliers and people who farm and grow for quality and flavor. Um, for quite a few years, I worked as a, as a restaurant critic. Um, so I, I ate out at literally thousands of restaurants at somebody else's expense. It's not, it's not a bad gig if you can get it. Um, but what I, what I learned above all else in that time is, you know, yes, it does matter who's cooking, how skilled the chef is, et cetera. But ultimately what matters most, if you want to offer great food, is the quality of the raw materials. And the best of those are local, fresh and produced as naturally as possible. So, you know, so what's the point of all that? Well, the, the point is that if we want to eat the most delicious food, then that means local and produced in harmony with nature. And there, there's no contradiction there in fact it, it, it's an imperative um, and you can see it you can see it all around us the best places to eat restaurants cafes pubs uh, or at, at the heart of local food, food communities um, they underpin the producers uh, they provide one of the most crucial routes to market but we only have to look at the current situation with independent places to eat severely restricted in their ability to trade at the moment and and, and the consequent not knock-on effect that that's having on on local suppliers and growers. And so in, in that way, I suppose we, that's how we play our part in supporting and maintaining life in local food systems and sustainable food production. But for me, there's always a, a slightly uncomfortable caveat to that, which is that it's still a minority sport. It's like, we're, we're a force for good in that respect, but we're feeding a small subsection of society, underp underpinning a tiny proportion of total food production. And what we offer, which in my view should be routine, <laughs> is unobtainable for some and, and an occasional treat for many. And why is that the case? Well, that'd be money, of course. And the reality is that, you know, as, as, as has been spoken about already, and you alluded to at the start, Andy, on, on the whole, we're buying things in a significantly higher price point than purchasing intensively produced alternatives. 
Uh, and there's an audience for that, but it relies on, well, one, a certain level of affluence, and two, a willingness to prioritise spending on better food. And sort of, you know, the, 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 on those two points, I mean, uh, in terms of having the, uh, you know, the, the affordability of food, uh, it's, it's not a point exclusive to restaurants. The idea is often put about by, uh, put about the, the better quality, sustainably produced food is a middle class indulgence. It's, it's often couched in language that suggests that we need cheaper food because that's all the less well off can afford. Well, even putting aside the illusion of that cheapness, and we all know that the so-called, as again has been said, so-called cheap food is nothing of the sort. The costs in terms of impacts on, on health, the environment and local economies are, are simply paid elsewhere by society as a whole. This argument also has, it's got, you know, it's got something of the, um, is it Marie Antoinette? I think it's Marie Antoinette about it. You know, it's, it's, it's let them eat cake or let them eat crap food as if that were an end in itself. And the quality, the nutritional value, um, the environmental cost aren't relevant to what you're getting for your money. And to bring it back to restaurants for a moment, that's one of the reasons that we don't find more eating places operating in the way that we and others do. I mean, there are, you know, there's a good chunk of them out there, but it's still a minority. And the reason is it's hard to make it work financially because the real value can't be reflected in the returns um, in, in, in the present economic context because the true cost of food is not reflected in its price and there's no reward for buying food that is better quality, local, more nutritious and sustainable other than in being able to charge more for it, which we do to a degree, but it's not enough to compensate for the, the higher cost of the inputs. And it's a weird thing about, I, I just, you know, I'm constantly fascinated about the, the way the value is thought of in food because it doesn't, weirdly, it doesn't reflect other perhaps less essential commodities. Um, you know, if you imagine a situation where a, a petrol station is charging 50% less for its fuel, you know, everybody's going to want to go there, queues down the road. But if it then transpires that that half price food fuel only takes you a quarter of the distance, let's say, people latch onto that pretty quick. Suddenly there's nobody at the pumps. This happens in food all the time though. The cheapest carrot you get in a supermarket is not the same as the organic carrot that you get from your local grower. It might have three, four, five times the nutritional value, for instance, and it's likely to be at least 10 times as delicious. But for the majority of the public, one carrot is perceived much the same as another. And I suppose the question is, 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 is you know, for me, one of the big questions in, in this idea of food revolution is, is what we do about that. You know, and I, and I do think that independent eating places have a role to play in that and there have been an agent for change. And perhaps we don't get maybe as much recognition for that as we should, because, you know, even in the most, you know, in, in all sorts of places now, you see an awful lot more local food being bought by um, uh, restaurants, pubs and, and cafes than you than you did in the past. And there are an estimated four to 5,000 independent cafes and pubs in, in, in restaurants in Wales. Um, and most of these are, are already the foundation for a little bit of local sustainable food production. So we've got we've got we've now got a movement in Wales called the WIRC, which is the Welsh Independent Restaurant Collective, and we set that up in response to COVID because we didn't have a voice with Welsh government. But it's a kind of an oddity, really, because a lot of us have been talking about putting that together for um, a significant amount of time before that, and it, it turned out that you know COVID was the, the the kind of catalyst for it to happen. But it's about much more than COVID, and we share the you know we share values in terms of local food sustainability, uh, the response to climate change, and we want to be part of that. So, you know, I think it's important now that we have 350 supporters and we're in constant contact with each other, and I'm hoping that that's going to be a, a way in which we can add our weight to the kind of things that uh, Angelina and Katie were talking about at the start. And it's it's refreshing to to see those things. Actually, we should really be part of this Food Policy Alliance Cymru, I feel. I feel. Um, but it, it's really refreshing to hear those kind of things because, you know, ultimately, I think the, the big issue here, and it's, it's the same one uh, that's been around for a long time, we do need to do things from the ground up. We have got to set the examples. We can't wait around for government. But at the same time, we cannot forget 
the whole point of Welsh government is it's small and it's close to us. It's meant to be a speedboat, not an oil tanker. And it should be nimble enough to make the policy changes that we need to really set the pace for, for the food, uh, food and farming agenda in Wales. Um, and I think that the steps that I see there, and I, I wasn't aware of them before, Katie and Angelina, I think it's really, really important in that respect, because what we actually need is, a, is an overarching food and farming policy. Um, we need to get out of the silos ourselves, but government needs to get out of the silos in terms of, uh, in terms of what it's bringing to uh, the table. Um, and, you know, for me, that's the most important thing. And I think finally, just to say that it's about imagination too. Andy mentioned this at the beginning. It's, uh, th 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 there is no reason why we can't have, well, Wales can't set the pace in this respect. Many of the powers are already available to us and whether or not we need to find ways around them. We're a small nation, we can be nimble, we need to take advantage of that. Um, and we need to imagine how we want food and farming to look in Wales and, uh, and make that dream real. Great, thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much, Simon. And some great, some great, great points. We'll come to. I will kick off with a response to a question that Patrick from um, Abergavenny has um, posed around, or a, a comment around, saying, "Without a strategic government campaign, the exciting pursuit of the possible will never scale up the capacity required." And one of the framings that we're using on the this Wales Food Initiative that I mentioned is to imagine that all of the organisations concerned with food in Wales are inside a big transparent, big, massive transparent ball. And the ball is rolling towards, down the hill, towards the edge of a cliff, and we can all see the cliff. And we know that if all of the organizations in that ball pushed to the right or to the left at the same time, they could change the direction of the ball. And it seems that the problem is right now, everyone's going right, push on three, you go, one, well, on three or after three? And we can never quite get the timing right of our push to nudge this beach ball onto a different track. So I guess a quick comment from each of you to respond to Patrick's question about saying, you know, can, what, how do we bring the organisations, including government, together to, to get that on the count of three, push to the right, and actually shift the system? Picking up on Simon's last point, that if you can't do this in a small country that's got a Wellbeing Few Generations Act, surely it can't be done anywhere. And so this comments on how we coordinate those people. I think Kate, you've all, you're all working on elements of this already. Um, and we'll go through the same order that we did the speakers, so Angelina, then Katie, Duncan, then Simon, just a quick comment on that. Then we'll dive into the rest of the questions. Angelina. Yeah, thanks Andy. That's exactly what we're trying to do with the Food Policy Alliance Cymru is to get us all pushing in the same direction at the same time. And I think it also, I think we're galvanized by these windows of opportunities that have opened up right now with Brexit coming, elections on the horizon, and in the midst of COVID where Welsh government is like, ah, what do we do? We want to support these different uh, green recovery and jobs, and how can we do that? So there's a unique opportunity right now in this moment of time, and it's about coming together. Right. OK, thank you. Katie, you're already doing quite a big part of this. What's the how do you engage with government to get them on board in the same way that you know, Angelina is talking about with that wider piece? For me, it's about picking a thing. So I think um, you need to pick a thing that people can galvanise around and, and, and it touches on as many things as possible. And actually, this is a slide I didn't show, but that I was would have done if I had time. One of the things that I've been playing around with is thinking about um, school food as a universal basic service. So universal basic service would be something like the NHS. And this would enable us to get around this really horrendous situation that we have with the 70,000 children living in poverty, not being able to access free school meals. We could pull on procurement levers to make sure that we're um, creating the infrastructure and the capacity within the Welsh food system, we could match that to school food standards to make sure that we've got the right school food standards and they match what we can produce, but also what the um, Welsh government's uh, recommended diet is. Um, and it would also kind of then fit with the government's kind of pursual of um, making sure that we've got fair work and that that's paying and that can fit into, you know, caterers section within schools, as well as, you know, the food production side, 
So for me, picking something like that, especially when we're looking at Brexit, that touches on nature, the environment, how food's produced, how it gets to our children, um, I think for me is the way to go. Great, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, Duncan. Yeah. Um, so, because you're, I'm a bit concerned because your approach about kind of going where the energy is scares, well, scares the yeah, people. Well, the, how do we bring that in? Look, uh, you said the government shouldn't be an oil tanker. It should be, it is an oil tanker, <laughs> right? It's incredibly slow. It's not responsive. The people have been lobbying for policy change in all sorts of areas relentlessly for years. We still haven't got very far. So it's, it's, there's a problem. And one of the major problems is something that's beyond this debate is the fact that when people vote for, for in, in, you know, in the election next year, they won't be particularly voting for Welsh policies, right? The, 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 they'll, they'll, be vote, they'll be looking at Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson saying, I like him better than him, so I'm gonna vote whatever, right? There's a disconnect between power the people power and policy and we're in the middle doing our best but we're not powerful we're not strong and we don't have that much influence in the big scheme of things giving government good ideas isn't enough at the end of the day you have to make them do it and that's that's the problem and it's a really hard problem um which is why this movement building and, and expanding well beyond the niche, the food niche. Um, the farming community is a massive asset right now because they're in an absolute crisis and they are a political priority. And we, and, and that, you know, we need to work with them. So that, that it, it's, it's about, we have to think about power and we have to think, where is the power? How do we get the power? It's not just about ideas. It's not just about this is a really good policy. Yeah, it's a really good policy and the government's looking the other way. Um, and that's, that's the issue. So I completely agree that we need policies, right? There's not, no way, but how do we get them? And that's what revolutions are about. Simon, I know that you've had mixed experiences of trying to get government to push at the same time as everyone else. Just I mean, from, you know, from, from you know being a, being a noted voice in in the world that you're in, what are your experiences and learning about how we actually catalyse this rather than just keeping pushing on opposite sides of the beach ball at the same time? <clears throat> well, I think I think uh, Duncan's right in the sense that uh, it, it it is an oil tanker in the speed in terms of the speed it moves out at the moment, and certainly my experiences over the last few months where, we, where I, I've been talking to the Welsh government once twice a week, ministers, civil servants about. The whole COVID situation um, has taught me a lot of lessons about the size of the challenge in that respect, but it is a challenge that we have to take on and actually it is possible. Um, what we do need is, is what's already been said, we need a lot more cohesion, we need to be incredibly smart, we need people who know about how government operates, I'm afraid it's all those things, some of which aren't you know the most attractive things, but if we're going to make change then it has to be that way. Um, I think also is that it's, it, you know, at times I felt like giving up on the whole government thing altogether, you know, just, just get on with it. And uh, you do things at a local level. Um, you look after those around you and you make some small changes. But ultimately, if you do that, you're kind of giving in on democracy as well. And I think a lot of the problem that we've got here, as Duncan's readily identified, is the, is the, is the, the failure of our democracy at all levels. Um, in Wales and it's interesting to see that some of the most exciting things being done across the UK now are being done by community councils, town councils, so th there is hope but we have to engage with this and we need people who understand how to engage with it. So a, a, qu a question that's come in from Alicia Miller, it asks about you know, what, how important is this again this role of food skills in underlying this and I ask this with kind of with a particular personal interest in this, I've, been, I've got the pleasure of working with an amazing head teacher in, in Barry called Janet Hayward, who's, roll, who's got some money um, to roll out some food boxes, big, big box Boyd in schools to, to build food, food literacy in, in, in primary schools across South Wales. And just hearing, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how important do you think it is that people have this familiarity 
with food. You know, the provenance that Simon talks about with the growing of it, you know, and from that policy perspective, again, Angelina and first then Katie, food skills, how vital can we get to where you want to get to without people having that proper grasp of the kind of the, how to use food, I guess, to create well-being. I Angelina. think one of the things that goes hand in hand with food skills is a relationship with food. And that also includes relationship with nature, a relationship with where people's food comes from. So many of our children now don't know where vegetables even come from. They think that they, they spontaneously arrive in Tesco's and, and that that's their origins. And so that sort of speaks to the disconnect that we have among the general population and the source of their food. And so I've been doing quite a bit of research about, you know, what happens when you build relationships back into that food system and relationships between people from between consumers and producers, between people and, and the land. And we're getting a lot of really positive results back from that research that indicates the power of relationships in, um, in inspiring more sustainable behaviors across um, food consumption, purchasing, preparation. And so I would argue that we need to reconnect people to the land and to the, the, the production of their food. And, and that, that then breeds that interest and desire and motivation to learn the food skills in terms of how to prepare that food, cooking it, what it tastes like. You know, what Simon said earlier, always knew that the carrots from his family's garden tasted better than the carrots from the stores. And, and it's, you know, reconnecting those dots. And I, I suspect, Katie, you're in much the same space. Uh... Yes and no. I think um, it was really interesting last night listening to the great work that, that Leaf is doing on the um, Citizen Assembly panel. It was really interesting to hear about that. Um, but for me, there's still this really fundamental problem that we have around aspiration in a big chunk of our population in Wales. And you know, when we started developing the schoolholder enrichment program back in 2015, which is a program, really an inequality program to bring kids back into school over the holidays um, and to make sure that they're fed well, they have the opportunity to play um, and new opp opportunities to have new experiences. Something that really, really struck me and has stayed with me was a comment that one of the, te one of the teaching assistants said to me, which was, if we can get these kids from primary school being able to just fill in their forms, fill in their benefits forms for the future, then we've done our job. And I was just like, you know, if that's the level that we're at in terms of aspiration for our children, that's where we have to start. And, you know, that was one of the kind of foundations of the school hall enrichment program is that, you know, the opportunities for them to learn about these things, whether it's from the, the National Nutrition Skills for Life program that we have in Wales, that's a community um, program a community capacity building program on food and nutrition skills um, that we're using in a variety of different settings across across Wales. Um, a program that we've developed within, or the, the dietitians have developed, that sits within the school holiday enrichment program it has in, has proved really valuable not just to teach the kids about nutrition, but then those lessons that the kids are teaching their parents and bringing the parents into the school classroom or into the school holiday enrichment program classroom. Um, at the same time so that they can they can share experiences and conversations around that is really really valuable and so so for me yes it's really really important across the board to be looking at this but particularly looking at this issue within those um, areas of of need and how we can really kind of inject aspiration into those schools and, and children. Great thanks Katie and Duncan I want to come to you in a minute to talk about the kind of the voice of the citizens assembly piece but just before we do simon within your wider work that you've been campaigning about for a long time around that kind of skill building in, in the hospitality trade so that people understand that provenance piece can you just give us a quick quick summary about where you're at on that and why it's so important for you well i mean you know I think it's obvious to me that uh, sorry yeah, sorry um it, you know it, it should seem obvious that we know every academic study that's been done on this says that if you teach kids how to cook, they'll eat better. I mean, you know, it follows. And, and, and so I, I think that we have the Donaldson report 
in, into education. It tells us everything we need to know. And I think it's got lots, it, it's very correct about how we should be educating our children and, and what that means in terms of the skills that they leave school with. And, and cooking has to be one of them and a knowledge of where your food comes from. So growing has to be one of them too. And, and, I, and I don't see any reason why we can't achieve this. I have a, I've always felt that if, if, um, if, if one of the parties put it in their manifesto that say uh, every child leaves secondary education in Wales with above basic cooking skills and an understanding of where their food comes from, that that, that, that would then be adopted across the rest of the UK very, very quickly. Someone is going to lead on that, um, and 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 I feel like you know we, we should be doing that, and could be doing that in Wales. Practically speaking, we have lots of great initiatives out there, and and, and some of them come and go, and some of them stick. But we need it on a comprehensive basis. I'm very statist about this. I, I you know we haven't got time to mess about. This needs to be in legislation. And again, you know, I see, I see in the chat people are talking about Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, et cetera, et cetera. To fulfill the potential of any of that, we've got to start putting some policies into place. It seems to me crazy that one of the political parties won't have something like that in their manifesto for uh, May 2021. Great. So uh, just on, on a positive note around the food literacy piece, um, how of our health board have, uh, uh, will, be impl will be taken on board a strategic... Goal, like a strategic goal around optimizing the food system for human health, working out how they can work with farmers, growers, and everyone else to do that piece. And I believe that one of the targets they're going to have is to ensure food literacy for every child in Ceredigion, Pembrokeshire, and Carmarthenshire. You know, food literacy to be defined, but I absolutely hope it includes those skills about where it grows, what it does to the land, as well as what it does to us. Um, Duncan, coming to you for a minute for me. There's been quite a few comments in the chat that you've probably seen around the role of citizens assemblies um, in this. And, you know, they've got, they haven't quite taken off in the UK in the same way that they have um, in France, where they were, they, you know, they reported into Macron with re specific recommendations. What are your thoughts on how we collect the voice of citizens, maybe in a different way to inform this, particularly along the lines that kind of the policy and the shaping the direction of food on that? Experiences and comments, questions on that space. Wow, <laughs> that's a really hard question. You got three minutes. No, I mean, I think, I think we need to see it as a campaign, as a political campaign. So we, we have to um, campaign for change, and and think about it like that, and be in that mindset of kicking ass, as it were, rather than proposing the right thing. Um, I think that's one thing. Obviously, we're proposing the right thing, but you know what I mean. It's 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 the it's the story, the narrative with it. Um, it should be more, I think, more about campaigning the narrative rather than talking. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I mean, the the Wellbeing Alliance, which you mentioned, I was part of. I mean, we're thinking about the elections and. Uh, thinking about the fundamental problem that people are not voting for policies in Wales. Uh, they don't vote for policies. Um, at least most people don't. Some do, uh, but not enough. <laughs> and, um, and whether we can get together all the different movements in well-being, food, but also equality, um, local communities, whatever, and, and do a really big push on, on informing people uh, about Welsh policies and what the you know what part, party political what parties stand for, and getting people to vote for policies rather than for what they see on social media, which is going to be blitzed by the by um you know, we're going to be blitzed in in May by the the right wing populist social media. I mean, don't don't let's not think anything otherwise. We're going to be swamped um, unless we fight back in kind. Um, so I think it's more about that um, thinking, campaigning and thinking um, we've got to get out of our bubble. We've got to start push. You know, we've got to start changing the, polit the politics rather than just the policy. And I think we can do that. It's up there. We're, de you know, Wales in desperate situation at the moment. And next year is going to be dire. So the political energy is there. It's there. People are desperate. And, and we can, uh, we need to tap that somehow. 
I don't, I'm not giving you a solution here, right? Because I don't know. But if yeah, we right. start getting together and start thinking like, you know, thinking about this, then we'll come up with something. People always do, you know. We have the solutions. We are the solution. Well, no, we are indeed. And the people listening to the call, I know many, you know, many of the people are on there are, you know, are people that we, we hang out with at, at events and so on. So I think that is absolutely, that's absolutely vital. And I guess what, what, what strikes me as well is that in this, you know, it's within this kind of fermenting this revolution. Um, if we were to look, looking, you know, say three or four years, well, bearing in mind, I guess, if you took 2030 as a target, when we've got to take half of the CO2 out of the entire food system, as well as lock in our kind of regenerative pieces around, around biodiversity and so on, as well as turning off the tap on the increase in diabetes and so on. How, what, what, are the, what are the steps that the rest of us here on the call, you know, we've got 30 or 40 people on the call, 50 people, I don't know. What are the steps that individual people can take around this? And I think there's it, and I'm not couching that, suggesting it's not corporates or government's job to change, but as agents of change, which is why we're here, what, what are the recommendations that you think you know, every person can take themselves and encourage their friends to do around really trying to get this moving at speed and scale from that perspective? Uh, Duncan, let's we'll go back. Well, Simon, we'll go backwards this time. Um, I, I, I think actually it's, it's to coalesce um, around the Food Alliance, Food Policy Alliance Cymru. That's what I've decided in the, you know, because in all the, the reality is, take WIRC, the Welsh, the, the collective we put together for independent restaurants. That didn't exist in June. We had one uh, Zoom call that attracted 70 people. We now have 350 supporters who are communicating together, carrying out surveys on a weekly basis almost. Um, so, it, it, and that's all been done online. And, and the core group of six didn't know each other before, uh, only know each other online. So it's, it's, it's extraordinary in that respect. So it shows what can be achieved. And maybe this is the kind of resource that we need to do that through. Because one of the things that's held us back before is that we don't meet up often enough. We see people occasionally, and then there's this group doing this over here and one over here. So my, 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 my thing would be to get as many people involved in this and we coalesce around some uh, you know, key messages, which we can then pass on, we pass back. And, um, and I think that would be incredibly useful. I, I've got to say, I've never seen such a great uh, collection of contributions as in the chat panel there. I know that sounds like flannel, but it's fantastic. Great stuff. So again, okay, Duncan, from your perspective, what, in addition to, I mean, I think supporting these organizations is, is key. What, what are the actions that we need in, uh, to take as individuals, as well as those within our networks to try and bring this together? You know, some talked around coalescing around things, you know, ar around stuff. What's your thoughts? I think, I mean, we all live in our local communities where we have influence and contacts and, and connections actually with people outside the food sector, because that's where we live. And I think we, we all have, you know, we all have to engage with those communities and bring them in. And if we are an army of, little army of people do, doing that in our, in our local communities, then we'll create a big army. And, and that's what we need. So I, I think that's, a, you know, it's, it's about, we, we are all advocates and we can build, we can build strength. If we all, um, you know, believe in each other, <laughs> And then do do our bit. That the sum total of that will be uh, will be significant. Okay. No, no. I, th I think the community clearly has got a vital role to play. This, Katie. Um, I think we need to be looking. Um, we need to be looking at now, but we also need to be looking at our next generation. Um, and I think we need to be working out how we can support our next generation to have a voice and to have an understanding about the issues. So I guess that, you know, that, that goes back to the, to the education piece. And I think it's really important to highlight here that, you know, if we've got 70,000 children living in poverty who are not getting a hot meal a day, a proportion of those children will be voting in the elections in May or will be able to vote in the elections in May. And how do we enable them to have their voices heard on the behalf of their, of their younger peers? So for me, it's really key that we try and find a way to support um, and mobilise um, young pe people. Completely. Um, Angelina. That's a really tough one because I think individual
individually, it can feel like you're pushing an awfully big boulder up a hill. Whereas collectively communities, there are schools, like Katie said, the communities, like what Duncan said, it can feel like as part of something, you can achieve so much more. And I think one thing to just sort of raise here, the theme of this session is around revolutions. And um, there's been some key research in the US around revolutions and what does it take to actually trigger that policy change through revolution. And what they have come upon is that it takes 3% of the population. At the point at which you get 3% of your population mobilized around the cause, it triggers a chain reaction and it creates the kind of support you need to actually create the, the legislative changes that you're demanding. So a great example of this is the civil rights movement in the US. Um, but there, I think this research draws upon 60 different revolutions across the last few hundred years. And all of them point to something, there's something magical about 3% that I think it triggers then a domino effect of, of support across the population. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Wales is small. It doesn't take a lot to get to that 3%, reaching out through your networks to your through your communities and being active and staying engaged with the issue. We could we can get there. No, brilliant. And that, 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 I just put a link in the chat to um, some great work being done in the States um, on from an organization who's got a club called Nourish Life, which has taken food literacy information out to 20 million people. And I was talking to the chief executive of the organization yesterday and asked him this question about how many people would it take to make change, tipping point change. And he said, globally, he said, about 100,000. Mm -hmm. And I think we like to think it takes far more people. And, you know, our job as citizens, I think, is to recognize it's never a politician's job to lead. Politicians cannot lead, it's too risky. Our job is to make safe space for them to step into by providing the evidence of what's there, providing the air cover and support. And to Duncan's point, I think, by starting with community and building people around the things that matter, we can create that change. And the, the points about the young people, I think, and building literacy and confidence in schools so that those kids can think beyond having to get a job at less a minimum wage that they can't buy, it, they can't do anything other than survive on and barely do that, I think is absolutely vitally important. And it's, I think the fact that the, this event has been happening and the work that, the work that Jane and the team have been doing is, is you know, hugely important and great to see it great to see it taken over from or as a spin-off you know of the great work that's been happening in um in oxford with colin and colin and others in the team and so t tomorrow is tomorrow tomorrow sessions are about reflections on history and tomorrow how can we learn from the past and tomorrow to take that forwards i'm assuming jane that the comment the questions and the comment the comments here will be shared um, will be shared somewhere on the website or the kind of key comments there and resources that we can take out there forwards. All of us are trackable down in various parts of online or Twitter or whatever else. So it'd be, you know, this is about doing it together. And I know that so many of the right people on the call are here today. Um, I'm just seeing at the top of my screen, Nick, we are there as well. Nick and I, you and I need to talk about the food stuff as well. So great, great to see so many familiar faces, great comments. And thank you everyone for your contributions. To, to take this day to a close. Thank you, everyone.